So our next speaker is Michael Pershin. He has over 10 years of experience as a software engineer, and he wants to talk about Lisp AI. As you might remember, Common Lisp was once the largest AI language and got sacked with the AI, yeah, with the drop in AI technology. But AI is back, and Clojure is a Lisp dialect, so he will tell us about Lisp, uh, Clojure, and AI. Please welcome him. So hi, uh, I'm really happy to be here today and see you all. And uh, I'm gonna talk today about uh, Lisp, how Lisp evolved, the AI, how AI evolved, and what we have now in AI, and um, how Closure is represented in AI field. So I'm gonna talk about history, about the um, actual moment, the current moment, and a little about future. I was too excited by doing this talk, so I have 69 slides, which is a little more than I actually wanted. Um, so I may skip some things or have them on a shallow level, and I'm sorry for that, but this topic is huge and I actually throw away another 30 slides. Um, yeah, so let's go. And this is my agenda. So we'll refresh the definition of AI because there are different definitions. Uh, we'll talk about state of AI today, we'll look into the brief history of AI and Lisp in the AI paradigms and deep learning frameworks that we have, and also closure tools for symbolic and connections AI, and we also look what's coming if we have time. So one has realized that I have a recurrent déjà vu about AI, and the déjà vu is that uh, some things that I perceive as AI turn out not to be AI. And I started looking for answers and found that the definition of AI drifted a lot uh, since it's ex um, since 60s, and it's still changing. And basically, whenever we solve the problem, we don't call it AI anymore. Um, as an example, the guys in MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab they worked on AI several years and ended up developing expert systems. Um, other guys was working at AI, end up developing voice recognition systems, image recognition systems, and basically specialized algorithms which are not perceived as AI today. So let's put artificial aside and try to define intelligence. And mainstream, can, main, uh, mainstream thinking in psychology regards human intelligence as a set of separate components. Um, and those are le learning, reasoning, problem solving, perceiving, and understanding a language. And note that creativity, emotions, humor, and other traits that humans have is not there. And yeah, some great minds of our kind have been thinking about AI a lot. One of them is Alan Turing. Uh, uh, invented the Turing machine, a mathematical model for computation, and he also cracked Enigma code. He was interested in AI, and he introduced a test for machine intelligence. Basically, he said that a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human into believing that it was a human. And to check that, there are Turing tests conducted where the examiners see chats with humans and human partners and um, computer partners, and then have uh, to identify if it was a human or not. A reversed form of this test is widely used on the internet, and it's called CAPTCHA, intended to determine if you're a human or a robot. And it feels like AI these days is way uh, different from passing the Turing tests, it's way more. So um, the definition that I end up with was that it's intelligence demonstrated by machines, and it's also a field of computer science uh, that concentrates on this intelligence, intelligent machines. And also AI is frequently used to describe things that hasn't been done yet. This is called as AI effect. So lots of people 
are convinced that the impact of recent advancements in AI is comparable to the impact of electricity invention. And we need AI, and this is why I hold this talk here today. It's a big thing, in my opinion. Um, so, in case you missed on the progress, here are some notable things from the last years. Uh, recent advancements in AI in 1997, uh, AI defeated um, in a chess tournament the world chess champion uh, Gary Kasparov. Um, there, are cell, there are cell driving cars driving around in beta, but they are on the streets. I mean, here every company does it. I mean, every major automotive company invests in cell driving cars. Every big IT company invests in cell driving cars. And yeah, so I intentionally limited the list of companies. In 2011, IBM uh, Watson Computer won a Jeopardy game. This is the architecture, it's not a neural network. Um, and it's written partially in Lisp uh, and Prolog. Uh, so, in 2014, the Turing test was passed by an intelligent machine called Eugene Guzman, and it was a 13 years old boy from Odessa who managed to convince 10 of 30 judges that he's a human. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> um, in 2016, uh, there was this amazing research published. It's the facial. Uh, like real-time face capture and reenactment of RGB videos. Who have seen it on the internet? No one? Someone? I highly recommend to look at this one. This is really impressive what they do, because they take the real-time video from the YouTube, they take the, the actor, and they take the facial expression of the source and put it in real-time video, so you can actually uh, control Mr. Arnold here, or any other politician. Um, Really impressive. So in 2016, AlphaGo uh, won against Lise Doll in Go. A little later, AlphaZero defeated AlphaGo uh, using the um, tensor processing units. I'm going to tell about them a little later. The pix to pix project is a neural network that um, was able to process images. So it can create from the black and white image a colorful image. From the sketch, it is able to create an image. The last one evolved in Funny Project, which you also can find on the internet and try it yourself. I did. Funny cats. Adorable that the network can do such tricks. So the image recognition technology is now better than human. Uh, there are amazing stats on the Electronic Frontier Foundation site. I highly recommend to read them. Uh, just impressive, uh, like what those achievements are. Uh, same about the uh, advanced semantic labeling. So if we have an image, we have systems now that can identify what's on the image and map the pixels. And it's 2015. Now I think this thing is available as a service from Amazon. Um, speech recognition is better than humans, uh, starting somewhere in 2017. So it's relatively new. There are other advancements. The deep face algor algorithm from Facebook is able to identify faces better than people, better than I do. It's not allowed to do this uh, in Europe because of the data security laws. Uh, it's not deployed here, but in other countries, people can enjoy this, being tagged on the image. Uh, then there is other advancements among those that the open AI defeats the Dota player, also in limited environment, but still. Uh, you know. Last but not least, the more uh, law keeps working, so we just duplicate the number of uh, processing powers that we have still, and this is also the reason why AI advancing now. So the brief history of AI and Lisp, back in the 50s, there was Fortran that was programmed by using the punch cards, machine code, and the need for AI, and neither Artificial intelligence, nor Lisp, would exist without John McCarthy. And he coined the term artificial intelligence, and he also created Lisp. And he was convinced that it's a very good idea to have code and data represented as a list. So he made Lisp processing. And it was, in my opinion, ahead of time. So back then, um, his work was in, inspired by the 
symbol manipulation view of how the mind works. This is how we perceive how our mind works, which is not true. Uh, it's like we operate with language, with logic, and with symbols in math. And they use this concept to develop Lisp. Things a little bit different now. I mean, we know that our mind works a little different, but maybe that's the reason why closure is so joyful. So Lisp pioneered a lot. And Lisp was the first language where the logical conditionals uh, were introduced. I didn't believe that, that it was the first language where you have if, then, else. So I proved that. It's true. Uh, back then it was Fortran. It has arithmetical if, where you have three branches. Um, and, it was, and it also has uh, if, then, else, uh, but three years later. So another one was the functional uh, function type and though recursion, because if you can get the function to a function, the function then can call a function, and it can go deeper. So you have this recursion by, it's like implicit, and you have symbol type, garbage collection, uh, syntax uniformity, everything is, ex is expression, and um, microsystem, and the whole language always available. So you have REPL, and it's still very cool for exploratory programming. So I research evolved, and several paradigms became established. Uh, I like this list. So there's a symbolic paradigm, which is inspired by logic. And there is uh, logic and linguistics. And there is a connections paradigm, which is inspired by the neuroscience, that we have neurons and how they work. There is evolutionist paradigm, which is inspired by evolutionary biology, which all I can refer as genetic programming. And there is a statistical paradigm, that is inspired by probability statistics and combinatorics. So these systems, based on these principles, can also be intelligent. And the symbolic approach has its focus on logic and problem solving and requires knowledge engineering. An example here is the graph of engine problem solver, which is used to identify the problem with the engine by operating with abstractions. So for the left branch here, the, like if the engine is getting gas, and the engine will turn over, the problem is spark plugs. So basically this is how it worked back then. And the typical areas were computer algebra, accelerant proofing, planning system, diagnosis, logic languages, uh, the most famous of those expert systems, they were most successful. Basic representation of how the expert system works. Um, idea behind is that if a human expert can specify rules, um, to solve problem, then we can use the inference engine uh, to help not expert user by asking him and getting information from him and using the rules that the expert uh, has given to the knowledge base also solve problems. Um, there is notable system developed in Lisp. I would mention the ACL2. Uh, and you can read about the rest of those uh, on the internet. ACL2 is still used by AMD, and it's relatively new. And the Dart was used for this Gulf operation and probably paid off all the investments in AI for the United States. Um, contrary to the symbolic approach, connectionist approach is inspired by the knowledge how our nervous system works, that um, there are interconnected neurons, and we have 86 billions of those. Um, these systems are called artificial neural networks and are good on processing non-symbolic knowledge. They also can learn by examples and are ready to scale, so they are easily parallelable. Briefly, like very shallow explanation, simply put, uh, in artificial neural network, um, each node represents an artificial neuron and arrow represents the connection from the output of one artificial neuron to the input of another. And the deep learning neural networks, they have several hidden layers, more complicated architecture, and they also need more computing power to train and run. And the recent advancements that we have, uh, they are achieved mostly with deep learning layers, and they also utilize the computing, they also need the computing power. And the challenge here is to choose the right model, right architecture for the deep learning neural network, and to provide high quality data to train it. Um, I was once interested in a deep learning framework landscape and found this tweet from Francois. Here he made the ratings of deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, Kafka, and, and others. So he took 
uh, weights, 30 for contributors, 10 for issues, 5 for forks, and then divided everything by 1,000, and he got these ratings. I was not happy with those, because um, they are quite old. I think it's May 2016, and there is no closure project, and there are no closure frameworks. So I did it myself in this February. And we see that TensorFlow um, advanced a lot, and the absolute value is also changed a lot. Uh, so here we see it's like 67, and now it's like 350. Other frameworks advanced a lot as well. I also mentioned here the three closure frameworks that I'm gonna mention later. They're unfortunately not as popular, but they are relatively new, and it's up to us to make them powerful. Um, this is a reference, in case you're interested how I calculated those data. It's a snapshot of the data, but just for reference. Um, so let's talk about closure in symbolic AI. Uh, just a reminder of an AI effect, uh, because symbolic AI is uh, influenced a lot by this AI effect. Whenever we solve the problem, it becomes specialized algorithm and not AI. So if you need to build an expert system, for example, to help a doctor choose the correct uh, diagnosis based on a cluster of symptoms or select tactical moves uh, to play a game it may be reasonable to use expert system approach. However, the rule by choosing the expert system and rule engine is that uh, you don't need one. Um, it's very specialized things. There is a project called Clara Rules, takes the idea from the expert systems, implements it in Clojure. In the case I need one in Clojure, I would go with Clara Rules. It's actually Really, I, I would say it's really advanced. Um, it's worth to mention the CoreLogic library uh, that takes the prolog approach uh, to programming and brings it to closure. The prolog is the language that was used in the recent um, expert systems. It's just rule-based language. And the logic programming paradigm is evolved from AI research and it's widely used to develop expert systems uh, today. So in this paradigm, we define logic variables define constraints on them and have a logic engine figure out what values of the variables satisfy the constraints. So there are also a couple of libraries to do symbolic AI in Clojure. Uh, there's a symbolic pattern matcher from Cognizance, which includes functions that iterate patterns of collections of data. There is an OPS search library, uh, which is a simple implementation of a breadth first search uh, mechanism for applying simple strips style, uh, style operators. Uh, this means the stand for the search is the problem solver. And as example provided, um, there are the rules, like if there are the rules and there is the goal state and the current state, as a result, the system uh, delivers the actions to achieve the state. So it's maybe used to solve some, um, some problems. Uh, I didn't find approach, I mean, I didn't find where it's used in the business cases that I've seen in my experience. And Cognizance also importing a library called LKit to convert uh, three texts to the set of uh, rules. It's work in progress, so you can um, look at the project of Cognizance and search and even try it. I encourage it. It's really um, nice. Um, so, um, Closure inherited lip strength, like Lisp strength, and uh, it's useful for symbolic AI, but the main strength but still, that is still there that Clojure is very good for explorative programming when we do not know what we're looking for. So we can play around, we can fire up REPL, um, do things, and see. And I find that Clojure is well represented in evolutional and statistical AI approaches. There's libraries like Anglican, Encounter, Kixistat, Statistiker, and um, there is also uh, ways to do uh, genetic programming in Clojure using Clojure spec, and there's also other libraries. So I decided to skip those and go straight to the uh, neural networks. And there's three approaches to do deep learning in Clojure that I was aware of, that I found in, as a result of my research. Uh, those are called Deep Learning for J. It's a Java library, which is quite mature. It runs in Hadoop. So you can do deep learning there. Another one called the TensorFlow, which, which is the industry standard and the most popular framework that's there. And the third one, uh, do it nice in Clojure, and still call uh, as a lot of other libraries. Uh, so um, there are actually two libraries who work with deep learning for J. One is uh, Jutsu AI, another one called DL4CLJ, which is deep learning for Clojure. 
I choose this one because it looked for me more mature. But if you need one, you can also look the other one. So deep learning for J is good integrated uh, with Hadoop and Spark. And this library is basically a wrapper that allows you to do um, network definitions in a declarative and manageable way. And it's an alternative to use Java interop because otherwise you have to do Java interop. And there's like these sites where you can look at those. Um, so here is an example how to configure a simple multi-layer feedforward network. Um, and you see it's declarative. So I just define a variable which has keywords. And this is my network architecture. And then I have to solve the challenge of finding good data, good label data, and I have to train this network and run it. So basically that's it. As well. So the challenge of this programming is not to code the logic, but rather find the good examples, like find the good data that you can train the network, um, on which you can train the network. Um, another project that I want to mention today is Guildsman. Its goal to bring the power of TensorFlow to Clojure. The idea behind Guildsman is that TensorFlow core is uh, written in C, and uh, there is an API, so we can call it uh, via one layer of uh, GNI. And this project is a work in progress. So this is the Guildsman stack. So it just should call the TensorFlow C API with C++, which you can use with GNI and just go like this. It's work in progress. It's not ready. Contributors are welcome. And this is very promising technology since the TensorFlow is the most popular framework now. And there is some real, real, good, real cool things there. So there is a problem there, which is called the gradient gap in API. Basically, the current Python implementation, uh, according to the author of the Gilsman library, using the Cheetah API, and has uh, way more available gradients. And the C++ API has no 99, so these are actually very simple, and they should be added here or here. And this is basically where he, uh, I mean, this is the state where he is now, according to his last uh, talk. So you have C++ skills, you're welcome to help this project if it makes fun. Um, and this is the last one. I would go with this one. I actually, I like this one most. That's the Cortex. It's a specialized graph framework for machine learning enclosure. I perceive its goal is to bring deep learning neural network technology to developers with the least amount of cognitive overhead. There are uh, following components, the cortex, it's pure closure to define network's topology, the compute and GPU compute, this is the abstraction layers to train and run networks on the CPU and GPU, and there is also, um, I would say, plugins or interfaces for Kafka and Keras. And this is really cool because Keras is an open source neural network library written in Python, and it's capable of running on top of MXNet, Deep Learning for J, TensorFlow, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, and Tiano. Also. So we can, with this project, as like to my limited understanding of the problem, we can cover quite a good uh, share of this uh, landscape. This is how you define it in Cortex. It's also straightforward. It's a different example here. Um, so, but it's actually also, you define a function, and then you call, um, um, like, then you make these calls and you define layers like this. So after that, you have the architecture of your network that you can then later train. Um, it's still also a work in progress, but it's convincing. So, we're there. Uh, so I will have some time to talk about future. Um, the main idea is that technological evolution is a million times faster than biological. To get us to the state where we are now took uh, ten thousands of years, as well, tens of thousands of years, uh, quite a lot, and technology is evolving very fast. And those questions, uh, I mean, those areas of intelligence like creativity, curiosity, emotions, self-awareness, is still a big discussion if they are considered intelligence or something more, if they're indirectly induced by intelligence. Uh, anyway, computers um, cannot do that now to a limited amount, I would say. There are robots who can simulate emotions, but it's still a program. So I really like this quote because 
Uh, if we say that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and you look at this video of this facial reenactment um, program, you say it's magic. So that means that AI is there, I mean at least the image recognition, and it's mature and sufficiently advanced. Um, another one uh, that I'm looking forward is, uh, another project that I'm looking forward is the Ogma Neo Feynman machine. That would be the next thing I'm gonna dive in and look uh, how this works. It's a relatively new um, um, approach because the artificial neural networks that we have now, they are based on a quite old um, view of how our mind works. Um, so there's like new discoveries in uh, like since 60s in neuroscience, in machine learning. So we may, and the filming machine autos or the many of our autos, they say that they use those discoveries to develop this architecture. And it, the promise that these systems um, are low on resources and learn much faster than traditional deep learning neural networks. It already does the hierarchical singles prediction. Basically, you can show it how to drive the car, and it drives. There is an example how they trained the small car, which is managed by, or which is driven by a small um, Raspberry Pi, and it learns in minutes. So you just drive it in a control mode, and then after that, you just let it drive autonomously, and it still finds the road and does the turns as you did it even in a new environment. Um, however, this is still evolving, so I would recommend to read the article and probably look for this one and stay tuned. I'm excited if they can achieve something. Um, another project which is also controversial because uh, qubits are not real, but in 2017 the D-Wave shipped the first uh, 2000 qubit computer and they can do massive um, parallel computation and they can do it way faster but for some very small amount of algorithms but the machine learning algorithms are this small amount of algorithms this one is really exciting that's the google um, tensor processing unit that's the hardware that was used by the alpha zero to teach go to learn go and learn chess in in a day and defeat the AlphaGo algorithm without any prior training set. So the system was just given the rules and then played again itself, like, I don't know, 60 million parties, and then learned uh, to run it. So this one is now available as a service on the cloud since 12th of September for the price of $6 per hour. And that make it possible uh, for the companies that use it to gain um, a competitive advantage against their competitors who, didn't, who doesn't use it and train the networks and run the networks uh, times faster than competitors. So uh, I would stay tuned on that as well. And I have also, there are two camps, symbolic and connectionist camp. There are people with strong opinions that their approach is the only viable approach. But there are also people who believe that AI must employ many approaches and sometimes we can profit from the synergy of those Maybe that's the strength of closure, of closure because closure is strong in symbolic AI and it can work with the uh, connectionist AI. And there's an opinion and a great picture from Tim Urban that illustrates how distorted our perception of AI is. We see now uh, how AI advances and may even find it adorable that a funny little robot can do monkey tricks. And then the reality strides strikes back and we get amazed. <laughs> uh, currently AI is definitely hype. Hype inevitab inevitably leads to a sense of disappointment when big breakthroughs didn't happen, causing overvalued startups to fail and investments to dry up. This is also normal. There is even a graph for that called hype cycle. And this is when the technology evolves. This is where the mass media started to write about this now. And this is when the expectations did not meet and we go down. This one already, this is one, already happened once. In the 60s, they started AI. In the 70s, they published a lot about AI. In the 80s, they shut down the whole AI programs and it was called AI winter. No one would do AI because people did not expect progress. And ignorant of those 
if the second AI winter will happen or not, I still believe we will get an advancement because, the, because of this law. And this law is the power of tiny gains. If you get better 1% every day or some other time interval, and you just do this continuously, at the end you will be way better. So even if we don't have a breakthrough in AI and just continue with the small steps uh, forward, it's going to be amazing. And that's it. I thank you for all your contributions and for being here. Did I make it on time? Yes, you did. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So, maybe we can have two or three minutes of questions? I would be glad. Do you have any questions except are the take are robots taking over? I'm not going to answer that. We don't know the future. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so, so I'm going to preface this. On, on the whole, I'm definitely pro AI, but seeing things like editing live video um, or being able to map your expressions and also being able to say things in another person's voice. Um, what, what is like, what's your take on this doomsday scenario? You know, we had this wave of fake news affect an election. And then in the near future, we may be able to make realistic looking video with people saying anything. Do you think, I don't know, maybe it's more of a policy question, but like, do you think we can curb that? Or can you, uh, I guess, knock me back into the incredible optimist with use cases that aren't so terrifying? Uh, well, I work for the serving company. Uh, we have data, we have lots of data, and yeah, if we use AI on this data, that may be terrifying, but if the data is in the wrong hand, it may be terrifying as well. My opinion is that AI is only an instrument, and it depends on people. So if the people will use it as a good tool to do good things, it's going to be good. If they're going to use it as a, to do bad things, it's going to be bad. But the AI doesn't have its own self-awareness now. And it's a question if it will be. There are several books on that. There is um, huge, well, interesting talks from Nick Bostrom. He makes, um, um, he, he talks about the existential risks for humanity. And one of those risks is that AI identifies at some point of time that it's uh, self-aware and doesn't need humans. Um, yeah, so that's one of the existential risks is there. And there are people who think about this. Um, but I think it's now it's just a specialized algorithms, and it depends on people who set goals to those algorithms. But yeah, the technology is advancing a lot. So for example, this face recognition thing, in the, these guys um, in Munich University of Technology, they actually um, made the face reenactment of politicians. So the test cases for the politicians that were saying uh, things that the guys were saying and not the politicians, so that makes um, the trust in the media uh, smaller, like it just takes away the trust. It's a social issue that you may face in your future. And yeah, so we are aware of that. And it's shown, it's already like something, something to start from. Um, yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. When you looked around in all these libraries, did, was there anyone that stood out that it was easy to get started with? Like, Oh, here's a training data set, and here is the good constants, and here you can recognize all the numbers. Um, TensorFlow, okay. um, unfortunately, but uh, I would use I would use uh, Cortex. I would go with Cortex. Uh, if you choose, I mean, among those three libraries, you choose to run it and write. I would go with Cortex. Um, but rather, before doing that, um, you need to get the understanding of this neural network thing. So. I would recommend to find a course. There are lots of free courses on uh, deep learning, so you understand what Relu is and other things before you go into that. So you have some domain knowledge to start with. Uh, so you know what you're coding, you know what you're doing, and not the other way around. Um, yeah, more questions? Yeah, this is one more. I think I think we can finish now. Okay, so because I'm time here. Is running out. 
So I'm, maybe you can yeah, discuss. Yeah, I'm here for you today, so you can find me. Maybe we can discuss our grim future later over beer, which might enlighten our mood. Yeah, there is one joke. That There's one joke. The moment the AI is self-aware, it's going to look at its, in its code and it may find their immutability or mutability. And this, if it finds mutable, object-oriented, <laughs> multi-threaded things, it may get angry. Um, I hope it not, I hope this So not write happen. your AIs in closure. <laughs> Don't use transients. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.